Today we're going to be talking about John Alexander MacDonald, a.k.a. John A. MacDonald, a.k.a. Jam, Canada's first Prime Minister. Here he is on the left, and here he is on the Canadian $10 bill. Alexander Hamilton would definitely approve. So, uh, MacDonald's story begins in uh, Glasgow, Scotland, right about here, where uh, he was born with 35 children. Uh, the family was struggling financially, so the father moved the family to uh, uh, the British colony of Canada, um, which was part of the British Empire, naturally. So down here is what Canada looked like at the time. It was split into two sections, uh, Lower Canada and Upper Canada. Lower Canada was French-speaking, while Upper Canada was uh, English-speaking. And if you're confused as to why Lower Canada looks like Upper and Upper looks like Lower, it's because the point of reference is Lake Ontario here. And uh, it, the, the, the water goes down into the St. Lawrence Seaway. This is downstream. And uh, upstream uh, is the opposite way. So that is actually why it's called Upper and uh, the Lower Canada is called Lower. Well, shortly after arriving in Canada in uh, 1820, uh, the family suffered a tragedy. It would be the first of many in John A. Macdonald's life. His brother was hit in the head by a servant and he died. Uh, additionally, as a, as the family uh, kind of grew up in, uh, in, uh, in Upper Canada, uh, they struggled financially. The financial struggles continued. And at the age of 15, uh, Macdonald left formal, formal schooling and he uh, entered an apprenticeship to become a lawyer. Uh, at that time, uh, you had to take two tests, an entry and exit test. And then you'd have to apprentice between those two tests to become a lawyer. Uh, unfortunately, uh, McDonald's uh, mentor passed away when he was 19. And uh, he, he continued to practice law uh, unqualified, but ultimately passed the bar at 21, which was in 1930, uh, sorry, 1836. Now, before we continue with his professional and political life, uh, we should probably talk about how Canada came to being uh, and, and what it was like in 1836. Now, this area that we looked at in 1836 was officially known as British Canada. Uh, and, and the way that this came into being, uh, we, we had to rewind a bit uh, to uh, 1763, which was the end of the Seven Years' War. Uh, this was a war that uh, was essentially the first global war. Uh, the British Empire was involved, the French Empire, the Prussian Empire, uh, the Spanish Empire, the Austrian Empire. They fought all over the globe, but uh, for our concern, uh, it was their fighting in North America. Now, the war was about trade, and about a million people ended up dying. But in, in North America, uh, during the war, you can see here that uh, this holding here, this is called New France. This is the French holding. And compared to the Spanish holding uh, uh, down here and the, uh, the British holding in red, it was a pretty large chunk of land. Now, the British ended up uh, uh, the victors in this war. And uh, the French, if you look here, this is the pre-war map. And over here is a post-war map. Uh, the French in yellow ended up ceding uh, all of their land, or much of it, to uh, uh, the Spanish in, in green here, and the British in, uh, in pink. So New France, which is what this area was called, uh, after the British uh, won the Seven Years' War, uh, this area, uh, in Canada anyways, became known as the province of Quebec. So, you see here's Quebec, and... And it remained that way for uh, roughly uh, until 1791, uh, when the Constitution Act uh, uh, split the province of Quebec up into Lower and Upper Canada. Now, kind of what happened over this uh, this uh, the 63 to 91 period was that uh, the province of Quebec was allowed to keep uh, their religion, Catholicism, uh, much of their customs and, and their laws. But uh, in the province of Quebec is during the American Revolution, a lot of British loyalists ended up going towards, uh, 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 migrating towards the east portion of, uh, of the province of Quebec, or eventually uh, Upper Canada. And they brought uh, English customs and the English language. So this is kind of why the country was split, or not the country, the colony, uh, was split into Lower and Upper Canada, uh, into the English, uh, the Anglophone, and the F, uh, FR, the Francophone. Now, the arrangement between Upper and Lower Canada uh, hit a significant roadblock in 1837-1838. Uh, uh, during that period, there were rebellions in Upper and Lower Canada. Uh, basically, uh, the citizens of both uh, areas wanted uh, to be able to elect their own representatives in, instead of having the British Empire appoint them. And uh, in response, uh, the British sent uh, uh, the first Earl of Durham. And uh, he, he went down to investigate and produce something called the Durham Report. Uh, basically, his recommendation from the report was that uh, Upper and Lower Canada should be combined into the province of Canada. And, uh, and he also believed that uh, 
that this province uh, should move towards a responsible, co uh, responsible government whereby they could elect their own uh, uh, representatives. Uh, this would take a, a few years, but within a decade, the province of Canada was able to elect its own representatives. Uh, another significant uh, uh, outcome of uh, the Durham Report and ultimately what led to the implementation of the Act of Union in 1841 was that uh, the Upper and Lower Canada were given the same amount of seats, even though Lower Canada had uh, a larger population. And this was essentially an attempt by the British to to slowly drown out the the French influence, or at least minimize it. And uh, this would cause a, a conflicts moving forward. And uh, this is a story where we find out more of how uh, MacDonald uh, helped move uh, uh, this, this this arrangement along. If we get back to MacDonald uh, and look at the period we just, just touched on, 1837 uh, uh, with the rebellions, uh, and then the Durham Report, and then the Act of Union, 1841. Uh, we're actually going to fast forward a bit through his, his life, but... Through the 40s, uh, MacDonald had a lot of uh, professional triumphs and personal tragedies uh, through the 40s and 50s, actually. Uh, he got married in uh, 1843. Uh, in 1844, a year later, he was elected representative. Uh, in 1848, uh, the first child he had with his wife passed away. Um, and then his wife actually became very ill herself. And then we, we fast forward a bit to 1857. Uh, he became premier of the province of Canada, so the head of the colony. Uh, but unfortunately, that same year, his wife passed away. So you're looking at this, essentially, this 20-year period. Is he's advancing uh, professionally, uh, but uh, his personal life has uh, so many tragedies involved that uh, he actually becomes a an alcoholic. And um, sometimes it affected his work, and sometimes it didn't. But it's something that comes up when you read about McDonald, his drinking habits. So from here, we kind of look at 1857 to 1864, and this is a really important uh, period uh, in the formation of ultimately the uh, Canada as a nation. And we've got to go back to the Act of Union. And as I alluded to earlier, the the arrangement uh, with the, with the French in the West, uh, which was now known as Canada West, and the English, the Anglophones in the East, uh, Canada East of the province of Canada, uh, the arrangement uh, again was not super. Uh, strong because there there was a there was a a clause essentially in the Act of Union which said that it's a, for anything to pass there had to be something called a a double majority, which meant there had to be a majority in both the uh, the Francophone side of the Legislative Assembly and the uh, the Anglophone side, and as you can imagine, it was very difficult for both sides to come to agreements on a lot of issues. And looking through the early 60s, there, there's a little skirmish called the Civil War in the United States. And from, uh, from the north, the province of Canada is looking down at the states like, wow, if, uh, if the north wins, you're going to have this huge army. And the U.S. is uh, always about this manifest destinies thing. Are, are they going to push up north and try to just essentially annex uh, the province of Canada? And so uh, between the political dysfunction that was going on due to the double majority and uh, the fears of what the United States would do next, uh, following uh, if the, when or if the Civil War ended, um, there was calls in the province of Canada uh, to kind of uh, come together closer. To combat the political gridlock and the potential threat from the United States, uh, McDonald was able to put together something known as a Great Coalition. It's a coalition between his Conservative Party, uh, another Anglo party known as the Grits, and a uh, Francophone party known as the Parti Bleu. One of the ideas that came out of this coalition was the it was the attempt to put together a confederation which would be attractive enough for uh, New Brunswick uh, and Nova Scotia, which were uh, British colonies also, to join. And uh, this map here is actually uh, July 1st, 1867. That's uh, Canada Day. That's the day that Canada became a nation. And the road to uh, the Dominion of Canada uh, took place over the course of many years and uh, three key conferences. Two of them took place in 1864. Uh, which down here I've highlighted is the Charlestown Conference and the Quebec Conference. Uh, I put 65 here, but that's incorrect. And uh, uh, and the third, uh, the London Conference, took place in uh, 1866, uh, December, uh, into 1867. What ultimately came out of uh, these conferences was the British North American Act, uh, signed in uh, March 1867. And it was decided that Canada would become its own country. And uh, on July 1st, 1867, that's exactly what happened. And uh, the first four uh, provinces to join were Ontario, Quebec, uh, New Brunswick, and Nova Scotia, as I've highlighted down here.
I've kind of put uh, when each province or territory joined. So uh, the last one was Nunavut in uh, 1999, and uh, we'll speak more moving through these territories and provinces. But on the same trip uh, in 1867 to London, uh, earlier in the year, um, Macdonald actually uh, wooed his second wife. So it was actually a pretty uh, fortuitous trip for him. He created a country and he got himself a wife. As a prime minister of a brand new country, Macdonald faced very many pressing issues. He had to deal with the, the states to the south. There's a bit of a trade war going on. He had to form a, a federal government structure. There were calls for an uh, intercontinental railway, which uh, he had to plan for. Uh, but through all of this, uh, Macdonald was able to uh, guide this, this four-province country, this little sliver that we see here, into this giant continental mass that we have today. Uh, most of it was consolidated under his leadership. And we'll kind of go through how he brought many of these uh, territories into the fold. And in 1870, uh, Rupert's Land, which was uh, uh, owned by uh, the British Empire but uh, controlled by the Hudson Bay's company, was ultimately sold to Canada for about $1.5 million. Uh, McDonald was instrumental in negotiating that. But uh, uh, during that time, something uh, quite important occurred in, within this territory was uh, uh, Manitoba, which uh, eventually got carved out of Rupert's land. Uh, there was a bit of an uprising. It's called the Red River Up uh, Rebellion. It, it was led by uh, Louis Riel, who's a French Canadian with uh, uh, Aboriginal blood uh, from the from the Métis tribe, and uh, they weren't terribly happy with how uh, uh, Canada, uh, the Dominion of Canada, and the British Empire were going about uh, just basically chopping this land up and, uh, and and without consulting the Aboriginals. Uh, some violence was involved. And ultimately, uh, Louis Riel, who uh, negotiated Manitoba's uh, uh, entry as a province into Confederation, uh, fled the country because of some of uh, some of the issues uh, surrounding the Red River Rebellion and uh, a little bit of the violence that occurred uh, when Manitoba uh, joined the Confederation. Uh, a year later, in uh, 1871, um, uh, Macdonald had to deal with uh, the entry of uh, British Columbia uh, way out west here into the uh, Confederation. Uh, British Columbia was uh, was a target uh, for the United States, but uh, McDonald was uh, was very keen and adamant that uh, Canada have uh, have this west coast here, access to the Pacific Ocean, and uh, part of the negotiation was that uh, if if British Columbia was to join the Confederation, there was a promise that within ten years uh, a, a rail connecting uh, uh, British Columbia to the east uh, would be built, uh, eventually what would become known as the uh, Canadian uh, Pacific Railroad. Now, the building of the Canadian Pacific Railway, uh, which I'll actually just pull this map down here. So this is uh, the building of the railway, would ultimately uh, uh, lead uh, to McDonald having to resign from office. Uh, not necessarily the building of, but the, even just the beginning of uh, the, the contract or the charter being awarded. So in 1872, there's an election cycle, and uh, the Conservative Party awarded uh, the contract to build the railroad to the uh, U.S. Northern Pacific Railroad Company, and uh, the Conservative Party actually received uh, significant uh, donations from the same company. It looks suspicious, and McDonald was forced to resign. Uh, the Liberal Party uh, won the election, and they ended up uh, uh, leading the country for the next six years. But there's a lot of economic stagnation uh, during this period. Uh, the, the railroad uh, did not take off or was not built at the pace that was expected. And so in, 19, in 1878, uh, McDonald again ran uh, with uh, the Conservatives, under something known as a national policy. The national policy, and uh, this is a little cartoon of the national policy, of an elephant uh, trampling over liberals, uh, promised to protect uh, Canadian industries, promised to promote agriculture, and promised to get the railroad done. So basically, uh, these promises were enough to get the Conservatives back in office, and Macdonald would again be Prime Minister uh, from 1878 until his death in 1891. Now, the next uh, uh, important date that I want to talk about is uh, 1885, and it's the return of our old friend Louis Riel. Uh, similar to uh, 1870, when he was uh, leading uh, the Red River Rebellion, he again came back to what is uh, uh, now uh, modern-day Saskatchewan and uh, led a rebellion known as the Northwestern Rebellion, and uh, very similar grievances. He, he felt that the Aboriginals uh, were not being uh, uh, considered in Canada's plans, were not being consulted, uh, but this time he was actually captured, tried, and hung for treason. Now his death was very controversial. 
Uh, McDonald didn't actually have to hang him, uh, but he chose to. And the bad blood that was left amongst the French Canadians, FCs, uh, because Real was one, and many believe led to uh, uh, a stirring uh, victory of uh, the Liberals in 1878 or 1898. And through much of the 20th century, the Liberals uh, uh, led the government. And a lot of it, uh, people feel related to the, uh, the bad blood with McDonald's decision to, uh, to, to uh, hang Real. Now, later in 1885, uh, also saw the completion, finally, of the CPR. And this is the final spike being nailed in in, uh, in British Columbia. So that's kind of where I want to end the story with McDonald. And you look back at his legacy. And obviously, there is the black guy with the, the Real incident. Uh, however, you, you, you side on that. Uh, very controversial. But uh, ultimately, you look at McDonald's leadership, and he was able to turn... This, this small four-province country into this entirely giant uh, continental landmass here of a nation we have today. And, and most of it is done under his leadership. So I think that's a good place to start uh, with McDonald and uh, to get a good grasp of how Canadians started as a nation.